Thank you for having me today. Yeah. Yes, the pleasure is mine. Good to have you. Well, welcome to the Nehemiah Entrepreneurship Community Podcast. I'm your host, Patrice Sage. I'm here with Mr. Stephen Lai from Penang, Malaysia. Um, I'm going to be in, introducing you to Mr. Lai in a minute, but the reason I have him here, we've had two back-to-back guests around this whole issue of COVID-19 in Malaysia. So we're going to be dealing with the impact of COVID-19 in Malaysia, specifically as it relates to Penang, because Mr. Lai is an advisor to the Penang state government. And he'll be dealing more, not on the government behalf, but just as an advisor, what he's noticed, what he's seeing. And he'll also talk about from the impact of the business community, particularly in his role. Now, Mr. Lai and many others uh, will be our guests uh, this weekend, uh, to be more specific, this Saturday morning, Malaysia time, as well as, and Friday evening, uh, Pacific time, he'll be my guest on a business forum that we do entitled Biblical Business Solutions uh, on Addressing the COVID-19 Crisis. And they'll be giving us insights, helping entrepreneurs with resources, and just providing with guidance on how to address it. We still have a lot. By the way, Mr. Lai, the mm -hmm. uh, business forum is almost sold out. Oh, good, good to know. Good. Good. So you and your, the panelists must be very uh, well-known and important people in Malaysia. Uh, but there's still time. You still, still, if you start there, if you want to register, just go to our website, nehemiahproject.org, or you can just write on Facebook. You can find the link or email our office. We'll make sure you get registered. And if you cannot, we'll figure a way to make sure you get the information, at least on video. Well, we look forward to having you. But let me tell you a bit about Mr. Lai as we talk about his role. So he is the Penang State Minister uh, for Domestic and International Trade, Consumer Affairs, and Entrepreneur Development in Malaysia. I'm not a state minister. I'm the advisor. I'm sorry? <laughs> I'm not a state minister. I'm the advisor. <laughs> that's right. The, the state minister advisor. That's right. He's, he's the, not a state minister. So he's just the, the advisor yeah. to the Penang State Minister yeah, yeah, right. for Domestic and International Trade. I have met your state minister, though... For some of us in the West, in the West, in the West, you all look alike, but you're not a state minister, you're right. And uh, he's proud to join the Penang State Government. Mr. Lai accumulated over 25 years of diverse business manager and entrepreneur experience in Asia, acquiring deep knowledge and strong networks in Asian, in Asian and China. Serving in various roles as CEO, COO, CTO, investment manager in industries such as financial data and technology, global fund management, software development, education and conferences. Mr. Lai acquired multicultural leadership experience while managing direct offices in Singapore, Kuala Lumpur, uh, Sangon, Bangkok, Mo uh, Mumbai, Hong Kong, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. Uh, he's a graduate with a double degree in mathematics and electronic engineering. You are smart, my friend, from <laughs> the University of Texas in Austin, so an American train in the U.S. and holds an MBA degree from the University of Michigan at N, uh, uh, N, uh, N on board in the U.S. Currently, he is the Industrial Entrepreneur Fellow at the Science University of Malaysia in Penang, Malaysia. He is also founder and president of the Malaysian Chinese, China, sorry, Greater Bay Area Technology and Innovation Alliance, and so many other things. Well, Mr. Lai, welcome to our podcast. Thank you once again for having me. Well, you are not only well-trained and educated, but you're also highly experienced. And so it's a pr privilege to have you not only today, but also to have you this weekend on our, on our forum as we seek to, um, to help the people of Malaysia, particularly the Christians, around the issue of COVID-19. Now, let's talk a bit about your experience. So you are a Christian in Malaysia, but you specifically advise the Penang State government. So tell our listeners the difference between Malaysia and Penang and why there's that distinction and why that state is so unique in Malaysia. I think, uh, like I say, I was, I was born in Penang. So I spent 30 years of my life away from Penang. So I returned to Penang after retiring temporarily as an entrepreneur CEO after I sold my business to a China company, uh, so four years ago. So I, I returned to Penang at the crossroad of my life. 
But I always wanted to come back to Penang. Like, you know, like I run companies in Vietnam, China, India, everywhere, right? But I found Penang is one of the best places uh, to live and work in, in the world, I think. One of the Why? Places. Yeah. I think it was voted, it's not by me, it's voted by CNN, all the polls, that one of the best places to retire and work. It was one time called the Silicon Valley of the East, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of the big companies like Intel, Hewlett Packard, the key side, all in Penang. A lot of Japanese companies are all in Penang. And so it's one of those places that, uh, that I remember as a child. That, so I, I chose to come back to Penang. I could, I could stay in Singapore, I could stay anywhere in the world. But I chose to return to Penang. So that's one of the, I think it has got all the right pieces to put together. It has got the right climate, it has got the right uh, uh, you know, environment, islands, island, so beautiful beaches. I got mountain and beach. It's got good food, great food, one of the best street food in the food. world. Yes. Right? So I think all things, and one of the best medical facilities in the world. It was voted by the US, uh, one of the websites say one of the best medical uh, in the world, right? So what wow. else do you want? <laughs> and I have gone to Penang for medical care, actually, my wife and I both. Now, you are U.S. trained. A lot of Malaysians uh, studying in the U.S. go back home versus yes. staying. And, and there's a strong U.S.-Malaysia relationship where yes. you guys easily get visa to, to America. And, yes. But yet, Malaysia is not considered a first world country. So tell us about that. There's almost this kind of dichotomy while Malaysia is still a developing nation, but it has a strong relation with the United States and Malaysians love going back home. Yes. Reconcile yes. that for us, please. Yeah, I think, I think a lot, of, I, I met when I was in the US, I was the Malaysian club president in my universities. And a lot of my friends chose to return to Malaysia, but a lot of the other foreign students, I don't know from which country, yellow countries, they either overstay illegally, something overstay illegally, and then they end up to become US citizens. Or, 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 but I came back, to work in Singapore straight away after the, the graduation. I never had a, you know. Uh, why do things, uh, I, I, I think Malaysia is really a wonderful place. Uh, you know, obviously a lot of us work in Singapore initially. Uh, it has got all the right combinations of, you know, you know the, the environment, the, the place to live and, the, and, the, and the, I think God has blessed Malaysia so much with so much resources, right? With so much natural resources, we got uh, wonderful, uh, uh, you know, food is one thing, but also the job opportunities are also here. Uh, mm. but not as much as, as Singapore, as, as you know. A lot of us work in Singapore, right? Uh, a lot of us, a lot of Malaysians work in Singapore. Uh, and, and we came back, uh, some of us came back to Malaysia. Uh, I think it's overall package. You know, I can always say the overall package, yeah. Wow, wow. And I've been to Malaysia many times. Beautiful country, great people, great food. Now, another thing that's unique about Malaysia, it's the mix of the country. You, yep. you have a very mixed population, but you're predominantly Muslim, a yep. minority of Chinese, and then Indian. So yep. tell us about that dynamic. And then a very small minority of Christian, you are among a Christian minority. How, yep. how does that blend yep. that country, that kind of diversity? I, I think growing up in Penang, right? I wasn't a Christian when I was growing up in Penang. I, 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 Penang is predominantly a very strong Buddhist and a lot, and a, and a Taoist society in Penang, right? And I became a Christian the first year I, I went to America, the first year in Texas, Austin, right? Uh, so, uh, so I never grew up in Malaysia as a Christian. Right? And I grew up, I became Christian in America. So when I came back to uh, Malaysia now, right? I mean, obviously, we are a minority in, in Malaysia. In Malaysia, I think, was 7% Christian. But out of that is 5% is Catholic, right? And, 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 and the majority are based in, uh, in East Malaysia, right? So red, red is a very small minority uh, in Malaysia, right? But nonetheless, I think that uh, I, I can see over the last two, three years, a growing number of Chinese uh, Malaysians became Christians. Like my, my, my mother became Christians last year. And a lot of older folks became Christian. I think there's something, something revival. I believe there's something happening in Malaysia, especially in the Chinese speaking community. Uh, the English-speaking churches are not sure about growing, but I think the Chinese-speaking uh, is growing, you know, the, the, the number of Christians, right? So I'm quite encouraged by that, yeah. yeah. Wow. And for those who don't know Malaysia, they're mm. kind of wondering, okay, Chinese minority in Malaysia, mm. uh, predominantly uh, Muslim. Give us a two-minute kind of historical backdrop here. 
um, you know, how did the Chinese get there and what's the dynamic there in terms of this majority Muslim community so that people can get a context of, well, of, of how the late the, the Grand Malaysia? I think my grandfather came from China to Malaysia 90 years ago, right? So it's a long time, you know, it's a long time. A lot of the Chinese uh, ancestors, they, they came from China, the, the, the Guangdong province, Fujian province, they came from all in the southern part of the province because they were poor. So they came to Malaysia and they worked you know, in plantations, they worked uh, you know, they worked as laborers, you know. So they've been here for a long, long time, right? Uh, so I think the and the and the British came to came to uh, Malaysia, right? Uh, the the British was in Malaysia five hundred years ago, five hundred years ago, for a long time, right? Uh, in fact, the name was five hundred years. Yes, yes. Wow. Uh, I think Penang was founded before Melbourne, because the first the, the the first governor, the guy who founded Melbourne, the British guy, after he founded Penang, he left for Melbourne. So he founded Melbourne. So Melbourne was founded after Penang. So Penang is older than Singapore. So it's one of the oldest port in the world, right? And and really it was called Prince of Wales Island, right? So so Penang Island, right? So it is a long history. Was it was a crossroad uh, for the spice trade. Uh, all the Muslims before they go to the the, the pilgrimage, they go through Penang. They from Aceh they would take a trip to Penang. From there they gather and they go to the Mecca, right? So, so Penang has been a melting pot of all the different religions, races for 500 years. It's not new. The Miamis came here to sell the thing, the port. So it's a, it's a rich in culture history. That's why we got the UN World Heritage, uh, you know, the, the, the status, right? Uh, so it's a very wonderful uh, place full of history, right? Wow. And, and, the and, how does, yeah. and how does a Christian man like yourself rise mm -hmm. up to become the strategic advisor to the, to the state minister in Penang, in that kind of role? I don't think there's any racial thing about this sort of thing. It's all personal, right? I mean, I, like I say, I'm an accidental advisor. I never looked for a job. I was trying to retire happily thereafter in Penang at a crossroad of my life. Then I heard there was a children fun fair in my fishing village where I grew up when I was born. So I just felt God asked me to just take a look at the, the children from fair and i met this this guy before he was state minister he was a chief of some party in that area district uh, area so he was officiating that 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 event right so i was introduced to him by the the, the village chief oh this is my friend from singapore we have a, a half an hour chat you know that's it i never took his photo i never took a picture with him i never asked exchange anything and then i left right and then a year and a half later, there was a major election, general election, right? And he got elected to become the, the state assemblyman and he became the state minister. Then he, 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 he said, oh, I met this guy, Stephen, in the village a year and a half ago. So he texted the village chief, asked him for my number and then looked for me, right? So I never asked for it. And I think he, he just remembered me. I just met him for half an hour, right? He just said, call me and then he asked me to be his advisor. That's, this is, uh, so I'm an accidental, but well, obviously God has planned for my life. So it's Amen. a right divine appointment, right? So yeah, yeah. Right so place, right, right time, right connection. God ordained. Yeah, I, 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 it's not planned. No, I never planned. Yeah. If I didn't go to that, that, that village, I got to drive 45 minutes to my village that day, the particular two hours period. I would have met him, right? I would have met him and then the whole rest is all history, right? So, wow. Yeah. So right. let's talk about COVID-19. Yeah. So how is COVID-19 impacting Malaysia? We had a guest earlier that kind of gave us some sense. I want to hear from you, your perspective. How is COVID-19 impacting Malaysia, in particular Penang? I think the impact is, on the surface, is similar globally. I mean, people are locked, some are locked down. They call it circuit breaker in Singapore. Basically, you have to restrict, you cannot, you want to go out only for buying food or not. So there is a restricted movement, a called MCO, Malaysia Movement Control Order. Uh, you're not supposed to go out, you know, to do things that, you know, that is outside essential, you know, things that you do like buying food or do something that medical, right? So on the surface, is uh, impact is similar. We are restricted. We are all locked down at home. Uh, so uh, same in, in the everywhere, right? So when you talk about impact, uh, I think it's share experience globally, right? We all have the same share experience. <laughs> yeah, I mean, could you could you remember in your lifetime? A global crisis like this where there was this kind of shared experience around the world from Africa to Europe to Asia 
all over, including America? I think I've gone through many crises in my life, right? Mm -hmm. and, and the difference that this is a global, in, in terms of shared global experience. But you know, as an individual, right? When you go through a crisis, it's your crisis, right? Everybody is going through a crisis right now, individually, locally, right? Whether it's the Asian financial crisis, which I went through, a very tough time, uh, where the business failure, whether it is a SARS crisis for two years in Singapore. Also, if you are personally affected by it, right? Uh, then you are having a crisis, whether or not it's happening in the US, it's happening the same thing. But well, you can see there's a difference between individual versus businesses, if you are the owner of businesses. I must declare that I, I happen to do not own any business today. Right? I used to own businesses, so I know difficulties of paying the salary, uh, cash flow. You know, I went through all these crises in my life. But this time around, I'm not. Uh, I must admit, I'm, I just work for the government advisor, and I, I'm doing some planning uh, for the post-crisis uh, uh, work for the government. I'm doing uh, something on social enterprise, entrepreneurship development right now. A big plan, right? So I'm doing this planning. Uh, so this time is a good time for me to plan right, for the future. So I must declare that I don't have crisis uh, like, you know, but yeah. I had a lot of crisis, yeah. So, so, so with that, let's kind of talk about the, is it from your sense, having gone through crisis, is it more comforting knowing that the entire globe is going through the same crisis? Or is it, um, is it, or is it a little different or better when the crisis is regional or local? I think that's a good question. I think that as a business person, right, you have to think global today. You cannot think local, right? And in a way, it's good that the whole world is shut down and you have time to breathe, right? Because the technology disruption is at a breaking speed. All the big players, Amazon, all the, all the Alibaba are taking all the business away from everybody, right? Now there's opportunity for innovation. There's a lot of opportunity I see. So in a way, there's comfort to know that it's a global crisis from the business mm -hmm. standpoint. But of course, for the individual person, employees, you, you may not see the, the end of it. But I think as a business person, you, you can see that it's difference. It's a difference. Like, uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, good insight. So let's talk a bit about your role. So what does the strategic advisor to the state minister do? What does that look like? Yeah, that's uh, currently, like I say, I must declare, right, my, my passion and my interest today, right? I, I focus uh, my area very narrowly, right? Because I have passion in leadership and entrepreneurship uh, area, right? I believe that even though Penang is really doing nicely, right? We have received 15 billion ringgit of investment from MNCs uh, last year, right? I mean, all the big MNCs from the world. 15 billion ringgit is about, uh, uh, you know, it, it's almost like three, uh, almost 4 billion US dollars investment. Now, that's a lot of money last year, uh, December, right? We had all the MNCs investing in, w, in the sector, electronic and, and you know, electrical sector, right? But I see entrepreneurship as a engine of growth, right? For Penang, uh, we need to uh, speed up this new engine of growth. Uh, that's before the crisis. I've been thinking about this whole area, right? Because there have been people in Penang government doing good job in West Penang, all the different, they are doing good job in promoting Penang as an attractive investment site uh, for the global supply chain. We work with the US, we, we, we export about 200 billion ringgit of, of uh, or US dollars worth of electric goods to US, the world, to the globally. So this is the main, uh, Broadcom, right? Broadcom is one of the largest company in the world. And, and uh, the, the, the CEO of Broadcom from Penang, he was the highest paid CEO in US last year, the year half ago, last year, year and a half. So he's from Penang, right? And so, but I look at this, my current job, right? Because the state minister has got a lot of portfolio, right? He's domestic trade, international trade. So I'm doing, working with him on international trade uh, to promote trading between nation like Indonesia, China, uh, different countries, how do we promote trade between the two parties, right? Two countries. And I also look into the cross-border e-commerce area, how to get SMEs to sell to cross-sell to each country, different country. So I'm looking at this area, working with different stakeholders uh, to do this. Then by other area that I'm really passionate about is to do the social enterprise entrepreneurship uh, development, right? Uh, which I'm currently drafting a plan for the government to, to execute. Uh, post crisis, right? In fact, this morning, uh, last night, I just set up with my, my two other colleagues uh, a Penang entrepreneurship community <coughs> uh, and, and on Facebook. And I've been seeing a lot of sign up this morning, a lot of people sign up, they're all posting their businesses, right? So I see myself as a bridge builder, right? 
because I've been doing business in China, Shenzhen, Shanghai, office there, Mumbai, Tokyo, uh, Vietnam, you know, I have office in Saigon, I spent five years there, I have an office in Bangkok. So I, I see that, that uh, the, in, in, in Malaysia, in Penang, what I saw was that you need to not work in silo. There are a lot of people in this, you need to get together, right? To work, collaborate together, right? Uh, in fact, before the crisis in January, I had my last digital transformation uh, series with under the state minister. It's called the Big Data and Supply Chain Management. And at that event, I launched a, a Malaysia, uh, I launched this, this particular Malaysia 4th IR Consortium, right? And not just me, I, I co-founded this thing together with one of the largest public universities in Penang, which is Penang USM, uh, together with the DRB High Com University, a private university in KL, uh, in, in Pahang, and then also the largest telco in Malaysia, TM Malaysia, and also Talent Corp. It's a national HR agency, promotion agency, together with a KEDA government uh, skill center, and together with MIMOS, which is a Malaysian R&D center, right? Mm. How I was able to do this because I am the bridge builder, and I put together all the stakeholders, and let's work together and form this consortium, right? And, and I'm, I'm one of the three co-founders in region members. And I, I love to build bridges, to bring people together, right? And, and that's why you know, I'm passionate about Penang, uh, uh, and I'm so talking to people to bring robotic training to Penang, blockchain and Canadian from India. So I've been quite busy last two years. <laughs> I love it. And, and so, uh, Mr. Ala, if somebody wants to get in touch with you so that they can be involved in some of that, tell me how did they get in touch with you? Or is there a website, email address? I have no website. I'm no longer a, a CEO. You no, know? I'm no longer a bis I'm basically a, but I, I have a Penang entrepreneurship. Uh, there's just a web Facebook now. Okay. Penang entrepreneurship community just set up that last night. It was okay. now hot. You know, now I see people posting it you know, every day. So I, I can see it's happening. Awesome. Yeah. So they can yeah. go to the Penang entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship community. community. Yeah. And they can yeah, go there the so they can community. be involved, get involved and connect, connect with yeah. you. Now, so uh, let's talk about the impact of the COVID on the entrepreneurs and the business community in Penang and Malaysia. Yeah. What are your sense? How has it impacted uh, the business community and the economy there, this COVID-19? I, I think you, the currently everybody is on a lockdown in, in Penang, right? So, but you can, you can know that what the government is doing now is try to, try to mitigate the pain, right? It's always cash flow. When, when you are a business person, right? How are you going to pay your bills? How do you pay the employees? And so the government came up with a lot of 250 billion ringgit of, of package. And then initially, then they came up with another 10 billion. So about 260 billion ringgit of stimulus package, about 60 billion US dollars on a package, right? But a lot of this is hand out to, you know, to the people who get you know, free monies. And then of course, they came up with the SME, uh, allow them to uh, you know, get pay their staff salary for three months. But these are all short-term measures, right? Short-term measures are, are there to, you know, to, to really lessen your pain. And then also the, all the banks are allowing SME to not pay the loan uh, you know, for six months. They can, uh, there's a, there's, 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 there's a one to them on that as well. So these are all the short-term measures, right? But I don't think it solved any problem for the entrepreneurs. There's a lot of things to consider, right? Because I've gone through the SARS crisis in Singapore where the government pay I think, almost half of my salaries and uh, it's fantastic, right? For the few months, that, for the six months, I think. So I was enjoying that kind of package, but I still know that if your business model is wrong, if you have, been, have no discipline in your business, you've been managing your business badly anyway, what's the difference to you? You just die faster, so I mean, what's the difference? Right? You have to really think about your business model and what exactly are you doing? You know, there are people who are really abusing, they're they are not doing things right anyway. Have they have used a lot of ego to run businesses, but now it's time for them to reflect what, what's happening to my business, right? And these are all the issues that you think about, right? So, so yeah. So would you say, in a sense, the crisis almost is going to weed out the, 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 the weak and vulnerable, the, the ones who are not doing things right in the first place? Yes, I, I, I think every crisis with, without weak players, every crisis, right? And except this one is a, me it's a mega, it's, a, it's one of the black swan event, right? Hundred, once in a hundred year event. Can you yeah. imagine? Right? Right? So, so definitely every crisis either make you stronger or you had to read out, or you had to really face out from the world. You know? yeah, yeah. 
And, and do you believe that what the Benin government or the Malaysian government is doing uh, is effective so far? Well, I think that what they are doing is nothing new. I mean, everybody is doing that, the whole world, right? They need to address structural issues. They need skill development, talent development. They need to address a lot of the reforms, you know? I mean, there's a lot of things happening today, right? I mean, like, like I, uh, as you know, like Malaysia is also unique in the sense of one week before the, the lockdown, right? We have the government change. We have, we have, we have a backdoor government change, right? Uh, on the federal, because I work for Penang State Government, right? Now, let's talk about that a little bit. So you guys had a change right one week before. So was that a plus or minus that the change happened right before? Well, I mean, obviously, I work for the Penang State Government, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, we lost power in the sense of the, the, the Penang Government is under the PH Government, right? And they were, uh, they, lost, they lost the federal government uh, power, right? And, and the thing changed a lot. Uh, so, you know, we have, so we have crisis, in, 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 besides healthcare, there's also other crises happening in Malaysia, right? First of all, the economy is not moving. Or we already know, like I say, like, even like business, the country is already not moving economically, right? There was already a crisis. To me, there was a crisis in the country. If you don't manage it properly, there's a lot of US trade war, right? Now they, no one talks about US trade war, right? US China trade war, but it is, this was the major issue. US China trade war was the thing happening in the world. Everybody talk about US China trade war, right? But so there was a concern about, who should we take side? To West, to West side, US, West side with China, right? We are really forced to take side, right? And then we have this change in, in the regime, right? Or, you know, they were basically uh, so happening to the country in the midst of a crisis. And then we have, so had this healthcare crisis, right? So you see, we are hit three times, right? Hit economically, politically, as well healthcare, right? So, but I think Malaysians are quite resilient. They are so used to kind of, Malaysian people are quite resilient. So, so <laughs> yeah. wow. Wow. So let's talk to the entrepreneur. So what yeah. advice would you give entrepreneur? You've been entrepreneur yourself. You've been through crisis. Yeah. What advice can you give them as to how they can manage this crisis? Well, I think the first thing first, right? I think that uh, when, I, when I say I advise, I don't advise the businesses. I advise the business owner or the leaders. Mm. At the end of the day, it's not about the business. It's about the people running the business. Mm. That's the most important, right? And how you make decisions is important, right? <clears throat> so I think... I think as an employee, you just have to accept, you know, whatever, you know, you have your, your less influence over the, the outcome, right? So I think the first thing I would like, you need to confront the reality. You need, to, you need to face the fact that this is a global crisis, right? I think a lot of people are still deny it. A lot of businesses, are, business owners are still deny it. They don't know how to handle this and they don't want to read, want to know, I don't want to know. You just hope for the best. That's the wrong way to do it, right? You need to confront reality, uh, what you want to do and prepare for the long haul, right? And, and even prepare for the worst case scenario. What's the worst case happened to you? Bankruptcy? Is it the end of the world? You had to prepare. I mean, you had to, to think about how you're gonna, you know. So this is first thing first, you need to confront the reality. What is really the happening now is very serious, right? And, and so then of course I will look at, explore all the options in short term, right? How do you survive, right? What are all the government grants? But those are not enough to survive. What, how can you do? cut costs, right? And all these all costs that you use to drive nice car. I see a lot of the entrepreneurs, even before they make it big, they, they have three, four cars, right? You know, I drive a simple car today, right? But I see people in Malaysia, they borrow money from the bank, right? They drive all the nice Volvo. They say, why, why are you borrowing money to, to have money? I don't understand, right? But for me, I drive a nice Toyota uh, uh, today, right? I'm very happy, right? I used to drive Volvo, I drive a nice car, Singapore, right? But I'm just saying that these are all the costs they need to consider, right? I mean, what are you... What are you going to do? Again, I'm addressing to the Christian entrepreneurs. I'm, again, I'm very focused on this, this topic, right? It's, you need to examine your life and live as frugal as possible, right? To last as long as possible, right? Then, of course, the third thing I would look at is I would look at my business model again because everything changes. Mm. All your business assumptions, all your costing, everything in your spreadsheet all change. Everything change. This is, um, this is something that, that usually when you say business plan, right? You change the plan every three months, every every month you review, but only change one or two items. But today, you change everything. You review everything. So you have to change the entire business, <laughs> business model, right? And of course, for a Christian, I, I, when I went through the crisis last time, I realized that, uh, you know, I, I really admire what you do in a BP entrepreneurship. I realized that I wasn't a 100% BP entrepreneur when I was in, in, run deep in the, my businesses in the past, maybe. 
uh, I call myself 50% entrepreneurs, 50% being entrepreneur because there's something that I did and look back in my life that I wasn't proud of it. I wasn't, I would have made a different decision, right? Uh, but I didn't go to your BE class, right? So you didn't come to, to share with me in Singapore, right? But I did went to Bible school for two years. I went to full time uh, theology seminar for two years, and and that's where I discovered that if I were do it today, the same businesses, what would I have done differently, mm-hmm. right? As you know, I deal with countries like Vietnam, Cambodians, uh, Filipinos. You know, I mean, there are a lot of different standards of corruptions and different things. I realized that uh, all have different ethical practices, you know, different different practices for business, right? And so, see, I see firsthand, right? And, I, and I, I, I'm now a believer of biblical entrepreneurship. I'm a believer, so that's why uh, it, it can be done, right? So, obviously, you need to review and ask yourself uh, which area of your business model that is really godly or really, I think that you need to review your model. Everything you need to review, right? The people that you hire, you know? So, you have to review everything, right? Obviously, uh, uh, then from there, you, you have to pray. I think, I think you have to really ask God, right? Whether you want to continue this business or you want to revise it or how you'll do this, right? There's a lot of things you have to think about, right? So, so I think survival first, but then you have to think of the long term, short term, right? Because there is no visibility, right? Today, there, it's not like we're going to finish this by next month. No, nobody knows what's happening in the next six months or a year because the new normal is not clear. No one knows what is the new normal. You can't define what's the new normal, right? Everybody is guessing. Everybody is trying to speculate. Everything is speculation, right? But you must know that... Uh, that there, there is definitely a new normal and you look around, maybe there are things that you need to, to learn, you know, uh, lifelong learning is part of my, my you know, I love, I love to, to, to learn new things. My house is full of books, right? And you need to learn new things, technology. That's why I've been doing uh, digital transformation seminars in Penang under the Penang State Government State Minister, right? We have, first thing I did was I brought a German professor to talk about design thinking. Then we have a blockchain seminar, we have the big data seminar, and we do IoT. So I'm a techie, you know, I'm actually a techie. I, I say still, I'm still very much into the technology space, right? Uh, but I, like I say, I see that Malaysians are a bit lazy. They don't want to learn. A lot of them, they just want to hope for the best. They just want to, we're still an offline economy. We're still a cash economy. We want to do things the old ways. Uh, because we are, uh, we are quite a lucky country. Country is very lucky. Country is a lot of petrol, a lot of oil, oil revenue, you know, from you know, the past, right? Oil revenue. So we're not really, we're quite comfortable in Malaysia. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. So with that, uh, my last question for you, by the way, thanks so much, Rita. Again, Mr. Lai will be with us on Saturday, Malaysia time, Friday evening, Pacific time, as we have the Biblical Business Solutions um, on handle the COVID-19 virus. And he'll be sharing these and many other insights with other with four other panelists who are all local Malaysian. It, it's almost full, uh, but you, you may, may miss left seats. Go ahead and register. Go to our website, neemarprice.org, or just reach out our office and get a registration link. You know, Mr. Steven, um, a lot of us look at the fact that this came from Asia, China specifically. Yep. And some of us who travel a lot yep. um, may be concerned about returning to Asia in the near future for a yeah. trip or business. So yeah. what would you say to those of us in the West mm-hmm. who may be a bit hesitant on getting back on the plane to go to Asia in the months or years to come as we get beyond the crisis? What would you say to encourage us not to just shut the door on Asia? Well, I. I think that definitely there'll be much, much less trouble, right? Uh, going forward, I think people must get used to get things done uh, without trouble. Like, because I know, I met you in Penang at least once, you know, although in a brief way, right? But I trust you enough to talk to you, to share with you. So the, the key now is how do you build trust? How do you build trust without face-to-face, right? Uh, so there must be something that we can do uh, based on introduction or somebody that introduced you to me that I, I trust this person, right? And this is very Chinese, actually. We, we believe in that sort of uh, uh, trust system that you know, are referred to each other, right? Uh, so I think that uh, definitely uh, what you say is a very interesting point because today in Asia, we are concerned people are flying down from Europe and America. We are concerned about you guys spreading to us. <laughs> so it works both ways, right? 
So I think I I could say I I watched the the Fox News, I watched the CNN News, I watched some of the some of the some of the the comments that uh, came out of America was quite biased, and I think sometimes it doesn't really justify, or it does not really give glory to God. You know, sometimes you understand that that there are also good people in Asia. Sometimes the the, the media from America uh, can be very biased, and people that I used to respect, you know, I began to see well, this, they really wanted to bash. Asia bash China, they blame everything on us, right? I think that uh, you need to look at this from the, you know, from a view as a Christian, right? God is sovereign. God knows everything. There's a purpose Amen. in everything. Mm. There is a season for everything under the sun, mm. right? Uh, you know, a time to die, a time to live. A time. Everything, God has purpose, right? So the, the focus is not on, on really, it focus on the change. Change is coming, it's going to be massive change, massive disruption. And so there's a lot of opportunity I see that uh, to replace those players. Uh, that's why the blockchain thing we are doing is about building trust. If I do business with you, right? If you have a blockchain a system that I can be able to know I trust this person because the blockchain systems verify for me this person. So I think there's a lot of things going to come out of this. Uh, I guess the the, the pandemic uh, really accelerate this this disruption uh, in a, in a way that. That the, the schedule has been shortened, you know, and it's, it's to me it's exciting. Uh, like in so in terms of traveling, right? You know, I used to travel like crazy. I used to travel offices, Vietnam, Taiwan. Uh, but today I can tell you that I can call anybody in those previous offices that I used to work with. They still trust me, so I can talk to them because the trust has been built, right? The key now is how do I build trust with the person quickly? Then you don't have to do all this traveling. Uh, but I think I think you need the West need to really. Uh, ask himself, right? I mean, the, the, the Asia today is different from the Asia when I went to America 25 years ago, right? Because the Asia today is very different, right? And a lot, a lot of Americans had never traveled, had no passport, right? So I don't know what to, what, what to say about that, right? So, right. Uh, so anyway, I, I, I love America. I love China, by the way, right? And I also love Penang very much, right? So you must understand that, uh, that sometimes we need to ask God to show us, right? Not to be influenced by what you read on the media and spend more time reading the Bible than read the news from Fox News even, right? Then you really, you think you're not, you're not being influenced by God, you know, show me, right? And, and, and that's why I think that, that uh, what you need to do, uh, you know, so, Yeah. I love it. I love it. Good advice. Good advice. Listen, Mr. Lai will be with us on Saturday morning, Malaysia time, Friday evening, Pacific time, as we go deeper in talking about biblical business solutions for the COVID-19 in helping entrepreneurs navigate through the dynamic in Asia. Mr. Lai, you've been so helpful, so resourceful. Thank you so much for being on our podcast. We're going to have you come back because you're very resourceful. Thank you for your time. And yeah. thank you for your support for Biblical Entrepreneurship. Well, as you heard, Mr. Lai, um, this is not the moment to fear, but the moment to have faith and move forward. It is yeah. up to us as Christians. I love his optimism. This is the moment of opportunity. Seize it. Yeah. Uh, I like what he said. Change your business model. Show in. Relook re at all your assumption and consider yeah. the new normal. If you want us to come alongside you and, and come and work with you through training, coaching, access to capital, and helping you build a kingdom enterprise, a business that is transformational, that is more than about making money, but rather is about impacting lives in a sustainable way, go to our website, nehemiahproject.org, nehemiahproject.org, and just get in contact with us. We'll love to come alongside you and join our community, the Nehemiah Entrepreneur Community. We have a global community, Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, Latin America, North America, and let us transform the world together. With that said, we have a number of events coming up. Of course, don't forget Friday and Saturday morning, Friday Pacific time, Saturday morning uh, Malaysia time. We're going to have Mr. Lai and other panelists talking about biblical solutions for uh, COVID, biblical business solutions for COVID-19. Next week, we have Oz Hillman on the Learning Forum. And then from now, we have a seminar that we'll be doing. And we have a number of free resource, free events. Also, August, we have a Nehemiah Week Conference, digital. 
You're going to be spend a week of learning, networking, fellowship, all online. Uh, look for more information there on our website. Having said that, let me leave you these words. May the Lord bless you. And may he keep his eyes shining upon you. And may you do business and live your life in such a way that one day you can hear those wonderful words, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. He will make you ruler over much. God bless you. Mr. Lai, thank you so much. See you on Saturday morning.